Today's video is brought to you by our friends over at Guard.io. One of the pillars on this channel is talking about cybersecurity and with so many things changing every single day, you need somebody to keep an eye out for you. Guard.io is here to do just that and when it comes to Discord Nitro malware, gaming malware, or any form of unwanted, unrecognized extension you may not remember even installing, Guard.io is there to neutralize any existing hijackers on your system and make sure that future threats stay far away. Search hijacking and browser jacking have always been around for years and only continue to get more and more elaborate. It's where your browser settings end up being modified without your consent. And you may never realize it until it's way too late. Guard.io keeps a constant monitor for any of these changes and alerts you in real time on data leaks and malicious emails that bypass your spam folder. And of course, unwanted notifications plaguing your system is a very real thing. Guard.io eliminates all abusive notifications from the source and makes sure anything you're notified of is something that you actually want to see and not another scam trying to get into your wallet. Ladies and gentlemen, it's as simple as clicking the link below, going through a few security scan, and then starting a free trial to discover Guard.io's premium features. If you wanna protect your family against scammers and hackers, then check out guard.io slash SOG and get a seven day trial and 20% off your subscription and the ability to protect yourself and up to five family members. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get on with the video. Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, remember the time the FBI ran a website where they distributed illegal child materials in hopes to stop bad people? Yeah, if that sounds like a brain twister, yes. <coughs> the FBI actually ran a website known as Playpen for a brief period of time where they uh, distributed illegal materials, but ultimately did stop a lot of bad people. Now, in order to break the law, in order to, you know, preserve the law, protect people under the law, sometimes you kind of have to teeter on the line of breaking it. Now, on my channel, I've always talked about computer safety, protecting your information online, and keeping safe. And one of the reasons why I talk about that is it's not just criminals you have to worry about. Sometimes it's the law enforcement agents that are hired to protect me, you, and everyone else. In this case, the FBI is an organization that not only gets hacked from time to time, in Infraguard, we're looking at you, but they're an uh, organization that definitely likes to... Um, uh, definitely likes to spy and, uh, and mass surveil on the people around us. And they've been doing this for decades, over two decades, ladies and gentlemen. Now, to understand all of this, you have to basically realize that the FBI is the chief surveillance operator in the country. You probably heard of the NSA, and that's fine and dandy, but the history the FBI has in tracking its citizens and being part of mass domestic surveillance programs is of key interest to me. So to understand, privacy gives us the individuality we want, but also true freedom. Living in a society where the government can spy on you at any given moment is not a free, open society. And if you're comfortable with giving up your information and giving up your privacy, and you might say, I've got nothing to hide. That's not a free world that you're living in. The government should only be allowed to look as far as they reasonably have to. When my doors are closed and I'm sitting on my computer in my own house, I'd rather not people peek in. Not because I have nothing to hide or, you know, something to hide, but just because, God damn it, I like to have privacy within the four walls. But we live in a world where, unfortunately, I think it's a little bit too late for that. The history of the FBI spying on the average citizen isn't actually new. They've been doing it to many notable figures throughout history, and under numerous administrations, they've done egregious abuses of power. And we're gonna go through some of them before we get to the actual playpen situation. Now, under the Johnson administration back in the day, the FBI was asked to conduct name checks on anybody critical of him and to investigate the staff of his opponent, Barry Goldwater. Political intelligence was requested on anyone critical in the Senate and intelligence reports on any political party were actually detailed in the 1964 Democratic Convention. So I've got some experts over here where they actually talk about this. Uh, in the 1960s, President Johnson asked the FBI to compare various senator statements on Vietnam with the Communist Party line and to conduct name checks on leading anti-war senators. So again, if the FBI was an organization designed to protect us, it shouldn't be there just to spy on us egregiously, even if it is under the guise of national security, which is so broadly applied, it's not even funny. And for the uh, president at the time to ask the Federal Bureau to conduct name checks of their critics and members of the staff of their actual political opponents is downright insane. If this happens today, or had this happened today, the actual news by the media machine would be monstrous. 
So again, even cases where the Kennedy administration was authorizing wiretaps on Martin Luther King, officials of the Nation of Islam, and of course, the Alabama Klan leader, and Malcolm X, very, very heavy political figures of their time. So of course, over here, Kennedy's approval of FBI requests for wiretaps on Dr. Martin Luther King, and several of the associates are discussed in greater detail, of course, in that committee's report. And of course, they talk about wiretaps on black separatist group leader Malcolm X, and the Alabama Klan leader. And of course, these are just some extraneous spying abuses. And it was found out at one point that the FBI had 26,000 individuals' names all cataloged on a list of persons to be rounded up in the event of a national emergency. Truly scary shit. Now, of course, what about people who are sending snail mail? Before the days of the email, the CIA and the FBI opened up around 130,000 first-class mails, and around 300,000 individuals were cataloged in a CIA computer system known as Chaos at the time. And if you want to read more about this, this is from the 1975 Church Committee Senate hearing. Uh, that actually overlooked the mass abuse of surveillance by the FBI, the NSA, and the CIA. And you may have never heard of other organizations in the government, such as the Information Awareness Office, which is a branch of DARPA that focuses on tracking terrorism and other threats to national security. Anytime I hear these buzzwords like national security, I can only picture a CIA agent getting excited about breaking, uh, just, a, a, just, just extending, just just taking a just taking a mile when you're giving them an inch of, of, of surveillance allowance, all right? A little bit of tolerance. Now, according to the New York Times, which actually showcased this in November 9, 2002 in a report, they showcased that the Pentagon was constructing a computer system that could create a vast electronic dragnet, where they could search for personal information and hunt for terrorists around the globe. So, of course, this sounds kind of like sci-fi to you, and if you've seen it in movies where people just throw names on a map, it's kind of the simplified way of what this system is. The ability to parse a shit ton of information and keep a surveillance checklist on a lot of, you know, bad actors. Now, you might be wondering, maybe this is cool from an idea of national security. But again, we're breaking the fine lines of what is legal and what is basically teetering on breaking the law. But of course, after all of those abuses were uncovered by the church committee, the FBI did not stop. No, 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 no. One of their big programs was carnivore. And for those of you who don't know what carnivore is, it's also known as omnivore. And the idea was to monitor emails and any electronic communication that they could capture. The way that it worked was the FBI had a Windows-based system loaded with packet-sniffing tools. See, data packets flow all around the internet and the FBI wanted to sniff those packets for the information they contained. They would install this system at the ISP level, okay? Meaning that when you touch the internet, you probably have an internet service provider like AT&T, like Verizon, like Rogers, like Bell, whatever in your country. They had their packet sniffer at the ISP's tower. Now again, a packet sniffer at the ISP level is about as goddamn invasive as you're going to get because ISPs communicate with other ISPs, okay? It's kind of like how the internet works, okay? It's like the big router world. After your internet, all these ISPs talk to one another. When you have the FBI sitting at ISPs at their level, it doesn't matter. They can sniff on everybody who's communicating to that big ISP and, and, and various other locations they're connected to. That's how invasive this gets. They don't need to hack the computer they just have a, they, they literally have a sniffer sitting right at the big router everyone connects to. Now to explain how ISPs can become so invasive, the idea is, is that every time like you connect to an ISP, you and hundreds of thousands of people are connecting to an ISP. ISPs run the internet. They're basically routers that talk to other routers, big routers talking to other big routers. So when you have a sniffer at the ISP level, you don't even need to hack the person. ISP store websites you go to, what you look at on the internet, what you interact with, where you send emails to if you're using clients on your desktop, what you download and what you stream. And let's say that you own a website and you host it locally, they can see who visits your website as well. Now, when it came to the carnivore program, the FBI was looking for terrorist activity, foreign espionage, such as state surveillance, child exploitation, and fraud activity. Look, I'm not saying that these tools did not have good intentions, they did. It's just that when you're so extra legal with this kind of shit, you're getting into the point where breaking privacy is first and foremost like 
what the FBI is doing, okay? It's definitely an ethical issue. You can do a lot of good, you just don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now, there were a lot of issues with Carnivore. For instance, privacy and the violation of that Privacy Act of 1986, where basically the way that this tool worked, packet sniffing, uh, would basically violate the ECPA. And unless you had like really specific court orders, using this tool was basically a legal nightmare. The other issue was checking data outside the United States. Because this was sitting at every ISP, uh, it wasn't really sitting at the ones from other countries. Uh, there was also an issue where conspiracies arose that because of this tool, you actually couldn't say words like bomb, assassination, or nuclear over the internet, because if you did, you might actually end up getting tracked, and at some point an agent was gonna visit your house. And after all the bad press and all the legal issues, you know, they, 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 they kind of threw the system to the wayside. Now, <laughs> what am I fucking saying? They just evolved it. They built other tools of the time, such as Packeteer, which could rebuild packets into websites or web pages and more elaborate messages. Uh, and then, of course, they also had CoolMiner, which, not a crypto miner, and while no official documentation exists, according to leaked information, could be used to analyze data within filtered messages. So now, want to know about something even wilder? The AT&T wiretapping rooms. Almost feel like making a Wendigoon <laughs> style, like, uh, you know, a rabbit hole video, a pyramid video, an iceberg video. But no, the uh, Patriot Act, for those of you who remember, basically led into what AT&T started to refer to as Room 641A. Which, for those of you who don't know, this was located right in San Francisco, where Neris oh, provided the equipment to intercept and analyze internet communications. The only reason we know about this is from a whistleblower known as Mark Klein, who revealed in a 2006 class action lawsuit that such a program existed, and it wasn't just this one room in San Francisco, but AT&T allegedly had so many different room 641s all across Seattle, Los Angeles, San Diego, numerous other parts of the country. And because this tap, according to Klein, was allegedly tapping into other internet backbones, they could get data, traffic from various domestic and internet providers as well. It's like an insane power vacuum for the internet traffic that just goes around every day. It's spying on a scale that nobody has ever seen before. So what happened to a company like Neris? Well, they ended up getting bought out by Symantec, where Symantec bought 65 of their engineers, data scientists, and their various technologies. And of course, this spying didn't end here because it evolved into something known as CPOV. So CPOV, which is basically the Computer and Internet Protocol Address Verifier, was a tool that the FBI developed and they've been using it allegedly since 2001. So this tool can collect information on a target such as their IP address, their media access control address, the MAC address that everyone blurs out in their videos. Yeah, they capture that. Browser environment variable. So fingerprinting you, open communication ports, list of every single program you've got running, your operating system type, version, serial number, what browser you use and what version, your language, the URL that the target computer was previously connected to, registered name on your system, the com company name on your system, who's logged in, and various other information that would basically create a bigger profile on the individual. And we found out about this. The world found out how bad CPAV was because of a bomb threat at a U.S. high school. So, of course, the way CPAV works is it's installed via a browser vulnerability, and then it gains persistence, meaning that once you get it, once you get the clap, it sticks around, okay? It's like an STD, a bad one. But what comes next is by far the most controversial and unheard of piece of surveillance, and one that is the crux of this video. Now, NIT also known as Network Investigative Technique, NIT, is something the FBI has been using and basically codenamed since 2002. So it's known as a drive-by download, and while it sounds pretty cool and all, it's a fancy way of saying a program that it's downloaded without fully understanding the consequences. It's like an unwanted browser extension, right? You've heard of those. I know I have. Guard.io has as well, and they're there to protect you. The reason this is so controversial is because it could potentially cause you or anybody to have FBI malware on their system, even if they're unintended targets. By hijacking a high traffic website and subverting the users to download malware, it could possibly lead to, again, unintended targets being hacked and not realizing. It's like dropping a fucking spy bomb on the internet in a way. So the other issue that comes out of this is jurisdiction. 
So you to understand, the FBI and global law enforcement have actually hacked thousands of suspected child porn producers through a string on a notorious dark web website known as Playpen. And this is where we're gonna look into Playpen, but before we jump into it, this entire operation that we're discussing is actually a blueprint for similar operations that have started to happen all over the dark web and the internet as a whole. See, the key point here is the FBI has actually, in a way, violated the law in trying to protect minors. Now, possibly being a vendor for illegal goods in the process of stopping it. It's like, you know those vice squad officers that, you know, basically have a briefcase of cocaine and they're supposed to sell it to a criminal in order to kind of like, you know, trap them in or, or, or you know, get them committing a crime so they can put the cuffs on them. Uh, it's kind of like that, except they've actually started selling the drugs. And in some cases, selling the drugs for like a month until they can capture all the drug dealers and stamp them off. However, in the process of it, they've actually distributed an illegal substance and God knows caused some actual harm in the process. Now, one of the problems of NIT was actually something known as Rule 41 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. Now, this rule specifies more towards executing things like search warrants in regards to computer hacks, intrusions, and all these types of activities. According to these rules, magistrate judges can hand out warrants for searches and possible seizures only within the specific, specific judicial districts where the criminal activities are occurring at the time. And it's generally understood that if you're a judge, you have to have a certainty of a location to where the target should be searched, especially in this digital era we live in. According to the law, if you don't know where the computer you're hacking is, you cannot legally hack that computer. You should have an address or an idea of where the system is, like maybe having a warrant on a home address or an actual IP. See, the reality here is, imagine if you're a judge in California, right? And you cannot authorize a search and seizure warrant on a computer that's, say, located in the state of Florida. Two different locations. This is basically likened to having a bad warrant, and one that could potentially kill an investigation. And when we talk about stopping, you know, criminals like, you know, child molesters and stuff, any investigation that, you know, they can take advantage of, any form of, you know, blown Fourth Amendment is just bad for the rest of us, okay? Nobody wants to let these sickos get away with their crime. So this takes us to Operation Pacifier, which was an attack on that dark web marketplace known as Playpen. So Playpen basically distributed illegal child images and operated primarily under the Tor network. The website was launched August of 2014, and in the last six months, the site owner, uh, Stephen Chase, was captured by the FBI. Now, Playpen's creator was sentenced to 30 years, which, in my opinion, is still too damn short. So Operation Pacifier basically led to a 58-year-old Stephen Chase who operated out of Naples, Florida, who created the Playpen website, you know, sadly, in, in, the, in August of 2014, and had basically exchanged a lot of illegal images and facilitated the exchange of these kind of materials. Now, again, I like the dark web, I like covering it, but even amongst all the fun, goofy stuff, unfortunately, a lot of marketplaces dabble in distributing illegal child materials, drugs, and whatnot. And the FBI and many law enforcement agencies work around the clock to try and stop that shit. Now, the website at its peak had tens of thousands of postings of underage victims, and it was believed that it had about 150,000 users worldwide browsing the forum and trading all of those images. So because of the anonymity in the Tor relay, the FBI had to get really lucky. And they did, eventually, in December 2014, when Playpen's unique IP address was leaked, revealing its location to be in the United States by a foreign police agency investigating at the time. So what happened next was the FBI seized the website, served warrants for its IPs and email addresses. They started tracing the money and eventually found the site owner, Red Hint. And beyond the site owner, two other site administrators were also arrested, known as Michael Fluckiger of Indiana and David Browning of Kentucky, both of which were given 20-year sentences. <laughs> Again, too light for their crimes. And this was actually the beginning, because what happens next is a gross violation, an outrageous act by the FBI, one that many would consider illegal. 
So the FBI wanted to go after the thousands of users who were on this website, and they worked with the DOJ's Child Exploitation and Obscenity section, and they launched what was known as Operation Pacifier. Now, using a court-approved NIT, which is, again, mostly a method, it can be different types of malware. In this specific case, it was one that was a browser vulnerability in the Mozilla Firefox client. You know, the client that Tor browser users would use. Yeah, this initial exploit allowed the, uh, you know, uh, system to download malware. And uh, once the FBI sent a payload, they would download a, you know, malicious file. And then the FBI would copy information from each individual infected computer and send it back to the Federal Bureau. So they also created a unique ID for each of those users. And they sent this information back without any encryption, by the way. So the issue here, ethically is that the FBI is doing a search of all these users without ever getting a warrant. In fact, they carry thousands of these search and seizures without ever getting a warrant for any of these users. And if you know anything about the Constitution, at least for Americans, the Fourth Amendment protects you from that. And combine that with Rule 41 like we read earlier, and this becomes a serious ethical issue, one that could even jeopardize this potential case. Now, for a brief period of time, the FBI, for 13 days, hosted this child, you know, adult material website and technically allowed distribution of that material. Some even allege that the FBI made operating the site and accessing it even easier. So they could actually raise the amount of users briefly so they could get just, just hammer them all down. They actually had a higher than average user count when the FBI was allegedly running it. Now, this basically became the largest federal honeypot of all time. So I want to just start off by saying I have no sympathy for any of the people captured. I think the FBI admittedly did a great job, all right? Even if you violated privacy and God knows how many different warrant laws and warrant protocols, at the end of the day, sickos got arrested. And that's all I could ever ask for. Thousands of people were, you know, given the knock on their doors, arrested, because they were distributing material that no country allows any legality on. And that's okay. Anybody that does anything to a child, you know, for me, when they get locked up, it's still too light of a sentence, okay? In my opinion, these people deserve an actual death sentence for harming children, okay? That's just my personal opinion, but, uh, you know, feel free to disagree with me on that. I don't think I'm going to get a lot of controversy for that take, and nor should I. Now, it was eventually argued in court that the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals actually ruled the warrant was invalid because of how broad it was. They violated warrant protocols. But because the evidence was gathered under the good faith exception, it shouldn't be thrown out. Now, this is a doctrine that allows exemption to an exclusionary rule, even if privacy rights are violated because of a misinterpretation of the Fourth Amendment, if under the reasonable person's test, law enforcement agents have shown good faith the evidence doesn't necessarily get thrown out. But that doesn't mean the judge was entirely happy in the situation too. In fact, the judge said, while we're keeping all the evidence, there was some gross, outrageous conduct. And let's read through it. The court lists six points. The government ignored the statute forbidding such conduct. In any criminal proceeding, any property or material that constitutes CP shall remain in the care, custody, or control of either the government or the court. Which they didn't. If you're distributing it, it's well beyond your control. The government facilitated the continued availability of website A, a site containing hundreds of child images for criminals around the world. Yeah, they did. The government, in fact, improved website A's technical functionality. Like I said earlier, they made it even easier to access. The government re-victimized hundreds of children by keeping website A online. True that. The government used the child victims as bait to apprehend viewers of child uh, material without informing the victims and without the victim's permission or that of the family. The government actions placed any lawyer involved in jeopardy of violating ABA model rules of professional conduct and raises serious ethical and moral issues for counsel. So again, ladies and gentlemen, because of, again, the FBI succeeding in stopping this kind of heinous criminal action, uh, the evidence was kept. But this is something where if you're reading it the way that I have, the FBI basically broke the law in order to, I guess, preserve it in a way too. And this is where, you know, you get into the points where corruption, privacy violations, and these kind of things have to eventually be kind of nipped in the ass. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the FBI is a truly wild organization. In a lot of ways, I appreciate the men and women that work for the federal agencies and trying to keep our national security safe and also stopping children from being harmed. 
But at the same time, this is like the perfect story of A, throwing the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to privacy, and how when you give somebody an inch, they take like an entire mile. In this case, they've taken like 10 miles. The FBI for decades has been doing mass surveillance on a scale unprecedented. Now, at the end of the day, I think one can say safely the FBI broke the law. And while their outrageous conduct was definitely reprimanded, ultimately they did a good thing. And that's where I want to ask you in the comment section below where you stand on this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is me, Mudahar, and if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike if you dislike it, I am out.